Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's Muscle Matter session on Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We've just opened up the waiting room so I can see people coming through. So um, we'll start formally in a few minutes time or a few seconds time. Thank you. Hello to everyone who's just joined. Um, I'm Rob Burley from Muscular Dystrophy UK. I'm just going to wait a few more seconds as some more people are coming through from the waiting room, I can see, and we'll start in a few moments' time. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. I can see that the um, numbers coming through have um, have levelled off, so I'll begin. Um, people may join us um, a bit later on as we progress. Um, I've also now managed to lose the screen of my notes on, so bear with me a second. Um, so um, I'm Rob Burley. I'm Director of Care, Communications and Support at Muscular Dystrophy UK. Um, welcome to this morning's Muscles Matter 2022 online seminar on Duchenne muscular dystrophy in children, which marks today's World Duchenne Awareness Day, and is also the first First live seminar in our latest Muscles Matter seminar round. Um, the theme of World Duchenne Awareness Day today is actually women and Duchenne. Um, so we've got some blogs out later today or may already be launched on that specific topic. So do look out for those. Um, our Muscle Matter seminars have become a regular fixture at MDUK um, and you can find recordings of all previous sessions as well as information on uh, upcoming sessions uh, in, in on our website and I think there will be some details uh, on the screen at the moment. Um, do also remember that our helpline is available to anyone affected by muscle wasting conditions and so do please contact us if you have any questions or are in need of support and particularly if anything uh, isn't covered in today's session or it prompts some questions about the support that you might be able to access and um, we can help with information and can either support you directly or point you to where you can get the support you're looking for. Um, our number is 0800 652 6352 or you can email info at musculardystrophyuk.org. Um, very grateful to be joined by an expert panel that covers a broad range of expertise on Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, particularly grateful to um, Dr. Adnan Manzur, who is joining us um, despite having COVID. So we've slightly moved the agenda around so we don't keep him for too long. So thank you so much, Adnan. Really appreciate you joining us. And a huge thanks to our sponsors this morning, PTC Therapeutics and Sarepta. Um, we're splitting the session into two parts. So we're going to be looking at research um, first First, and then moving into exploring living with and managing um, Duchenne muscular dystrophy in children. And before we um, begin, just a quick note on asking questions or making comments. Um, please uh, use the Q&A function that you should be able to see at the bottom of the screen. We've had some questions in advance, but we uh, really welcome some sort of live input. Um, please type your question or comment to help us manage the technical side of the event. We won't be coming to questioners to ask your questions directly. Um, and any questions we don't manage to cover or, or don't know the answers to in the session, um, we'll seek to answer through our website afterwards. Uh, and a final reminder that we're recording the session and that it'll be made available over the next few days days. Um, so without further ado, um, I'm delighted to hand over to my colleague, Dr. John Copier, who will chair the research um, section of this morning's session. So John, over to you. Thanks, Rob. Welcome everyone to this research section of this MDUK webinar. We have two speakers in this session, Dr. Adnan Manzur and Professor Linda Popplewell. First to speak this morning is Adnan Manzur, who's Children's Neuromuscular Consultant at Great Ormond Street Hospital and an honorary senior lecturer at University College London. His clinical practice is entirely devoted to neuromuscular diseases, but he's also involved in the translation of research into clinical practice. He's worked with NICE and NHS England to put atelurin, nusinersin and zolgensma into clinical practice through managed access agreements. He's one of the founding members of the North Star Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy Clinical Network since 2005 and also clinical need, lead for the network. This morning, Dr. Manzur will talk about recent developments in the North Star Network. So without further ado, I'll pass you over to Adnan for his presentation. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, John. Um, I've got a few slides and uh, I thought it would be useful for colleagues on this webinar to have an idea of how North Star has evolved over time and what the priorities are for now. 
next slide, please. So the work for the North Star Clinical Network started long time ago. Currently, it's a collaboration of 23 UK pediatric neuromuscular centers with MDUK support for organizational and uh, support for data management. The bigger aim had been to have a common assessment and management protocols in line with published standards of care and that they should be available up and down the country no matter which center the individual children are followed in and that there would be a North Star database and with parent and patient information, the data would be collected there. Parallel to this, there's an adult UK North Star Clinical Network which is led by Professor Oscar Levin. That's a, uh, a sisterly or brotherly organization, but slightly parallel and we are not talking about it. The back engine and the back room supporting the services is the same. Next slide, please. So, what was the impetus to develop this network? And I think um, uh, some of you may remember, probably not, but if you go back towards year 2000 to 2003, we were at a point where the diagnosis of Duchenne muscular dystrophy was easy to make. There was evidence from research that corticosteroids in D were of some functional benefit, but had adverse effects, and it was used very patchily. We tried to mount an application for research into that, which was not funded. The, meanwhile, there were further studies in, uh, showing the benefit of steroids. And we moved towards setting up a program where we could, could use steroids in clinical practice and have a management procedure whereby we could audit the clinical practice. So that was a time when Professor Mentoni, who led the project, and myself went to MD UK, it was a muscular dystrophy campaign at that time to develop the proposal of the North Star Network. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so many of you may wonder, why do we call it the North Star Clinical Network? And it's useful to remember and actually remind, pay tribute to uh, this gentleman. So in 2002, uh, there was an expedition uh, in which a person with a muscular dystrophy, Michael McGarth was his name, he w walked as a part of an expedition to the North Pole. And in that process, the MD UK raised about 150,000 in funds. And these funds were then applied by the MD, uh, MD campaign at that time through the North Star project, which aimed to establish a clinical network a cohesion of services in UK and a database to review the clinical practice uh, of DoMD in UK. So that's the historical uh, background. Next slide, please. So the objectives in 2005 when we set it up were a bit different and simple. At that time, it was to develop a nationally agreed standardized clinical and physiotherapy assessment protocol the initial focus was an ambulant boys who were using steroids or were in a position to use steroids and to develop a national database of a large cohort of uh, individuals with DMD. New slide, please. In order to fulfill that, the people who were going to be part of the network were funded by NHS. They were consultants, physiotherapists, some other therapists. They were entirely funded through their clinical jobs by the NHS. There were some academic consultants like uh, Professor Mentoni, Professor Pushby. And it was their salaries were from their NHS organizations or from the uh, academic institutions. MD UK funded the work for the coordinator who would help coordinate the activities. And there was an organizational structure where there was governance arrangement, but the essence of it was that there was a group of neurologists who would take forward the steroid management and a group of physiotherapists who would take forward the best management for physiotherapy. <laughs> and our partner was Certis, who is a firm, uh, IT firm, and she it de helped develop the database. New slide, please. <laughs> <clears throat> Right at the beginning, the professionals in the network, at that time we had 17 centers, we worked out what were the key data points that need to be collected 
and we had devised some case record forms. New slide, please. <clears throat> In time, these scan forms were uh, rejected so that they could be read by electro-optical scanners. But they set up a process that if a child came to the clinic, the clinicians would examine and fill data in a pre-specified manner. <clears throat> so the chance of problems being missed was small. New slide, please. <clears throat> the North Star database is a web-based database, which was set up with the authorization of Polycode Guardians. And the numbers of patients registered have increased over time. The principle of it was each family was asked for written consent. And currently, there's a total of about 1,600 patients registered in the database, uh, 900 ambulant and 725 non-ambulant. So that's a huge database. New slide, please. Um, so the first major contribution of the network was through the coming together of the physiotherapists and develop this ambulatory assessment score, which was published by Scott et al. And this was a score where 17 physical activities were chosen and graded in two point scales. Uh, each uh, the activity was marked as getting two points if the child could do it, one if the child could do it with adaptation or zero if they could not do it. The total score was 34. The methodology of why the assessment was made, what was the benefit that was published, peer reviewed. And then Anna Mehu did a lot of work through two articles doing sophisticated analysis, showing how each one of these points was valid and how they contributed to the assessment scores. Um, this has been so successful that the North Star Ambulatory Assessment or NSAA as it's called for short, has become internationally accepted, both for clinical measures and for research trials as outcome measures. Uh, new slide, please. The next tangible benefit of the database came through two publications and I've just summarized, these are in public domain. Uh, people can actually search and get them. So the first article was published in 2013 whereby from the data at that time, 360 boys aged between three to 15 years from 17 UK centers, uh, their data was analyzed about how many were on steroids, what regime of steroids tenders on, tenders off for daily, what were the benefits, what were the adverse effects, and first time in the UK population, how the loss of ambulation time shifted in the favor of the patients. So I think this was seminal and a visible benefit of how we could counsel families on the basis of UK specific data. New slide, please. In 2015, uh, we published the second work from data. And at that time, it was based on about 513 patients. This was a paper looking more at the research side or the interest of how things evolve in Duchenne and what are the specific features. So in this, we first time showed how the North Star score declined with age. This would be useful in working out that if North Star assessment was used for clinical trials, what could be expected as a natural history loss of function. And then that could be measured against the intervention or the treatment the child was receiving, whether the treatment group was substantially different. So I think that was extremely useful. Part of this paper also merged some data with the Italian cohort. And it specifically looked at what is the effect of certain gene deletions on the rate of decline. Because previously, there was a wide belief that Duchenne muscular dystrophy is a pretty similar disease for all patients. But we realized that individuals with certain exons 
may progress at a slightly different rate. Now, there's a particular reason for recognizing this is that in a clinical trial in particular, if the proportion of individuals with skippable mutations or mutations is different, the results may be unanticipated. So this was a paper for the first time, it was shown that the individuals which had deletions which are amenable to skipping uh, by exon 44 and 46 skipping, they declined at a slower rate, whereas individuals who had uh, deletions which are skippable by exon 53 and 51 skipping approach showed a faster decline. This was data which was particularly relevant for research studies uh, and how to design them, how to ensure that they are properly balanced. Uh, new slide, please. Between 2016 and 2022, um, there was again a shift in the way we work with the NOSTAR and goals. I think one of the important things that happened in this period were that there were two sets of standards of care of Duchenne muscular dystrophy which are published. The initials one were by Bushby et al. in 2010, and the second one was Berncrant et al. 2018. They were published in line with evidence available and expert evidence. And the challenge was, how do we put them in place in the UK? Now, this is a huge subject. Uh, Northstar is working in combination with other groups, uh, uh, DMD UK, Duchenne UK, Newcastle Group, uh, with further work about how to implement them. But that's a major focus. I think the second project which really made the benefit of North Star Network uh, become clear was the implementation of the Etalorin Managed Access Agreement. And I think most of you would be aware that Etalorin is a medicine which is genetically based. It is taken by mouth and in very specific mutations called the nonsense mutations that affect about five to seven percent of individuals with DMD. This medication allows more dystrophin to be made by affecting the RNA processing. In that situation, the drug was expensive. It was not approved by the FDA in the in USA because the efficacy was not known. And NICE reviewed the medication for UK. They felt that there was potential and should be brought but they needed a system and a framework where the medication be given and data is collected so that it can be reviewed in five years. So the NOSTAR clinical network, the cohesion between the clinical services, the database, that provided an immediate arrangement whereby the medication could, could be provided. So uh, within three months of NICE and NHS England making the announcement, we were able to start treatment of children in the UK with a Lauren. Uh, and we're now at a phase where we have delivered all the data uh, and NICE is reviewing that data again. This process also set up and uh, improved our network, uh, making it suitable for post-marketing surveillance of new drugs in DMD. Uh, and that is one of the major strengths and needs of the upcoming future. The third thing that happened in this time was international academic collaborations of really adding the focus of learning academically about Duchenne muscular dystrophy and diseases. So next slide, please. Um, these two studies um, were published by NOSTAR in collaboration with Trajectory Analysis Group, which is a, a strong statistic group in the United States. I think the paper on the left hand of your screen uh, demonstrated that within Duchenne muscular dystrophy, if the individual children are charted through their walking years with regards to North Star assessment and parameters of physical function like 10 meters time or rising time, one can look at cohort of children and appreciate that they are children who fo may follow a different trajectory implying that there may be a different disease severity between individual children. What dictates that a particular child will be in one of these trajectories? Can one identify a child 
and say which trajectory a child belongs to very early in the course. I think those are still research questions, but it opened that avenue. The second uh, paper, which is on the right, I think this is a positive spin-off of the work with the statistical groups. And in this group, what was done was, uh, you would remember the background to this paper is that when a new drug is marketed, the gold standard of evaluation of a new drug is that it has to be rated in comparison with a placebo or a dummy medicine. To say people who are on treatment versus dummy medicine, what is the difference? And this paper showed that if you look at the placebo groups and you look at real world data or natural history, that is like the data collected by the NOSTAR group, these data were very similar implying that data from natural history groups, real world data like NOSTAR and a few other registries could be used by FDA and other regulatory groups for evaluating drugs. New slide, please. So I think this is um, one of the final slides uh, coming to the end. Uh, one of the other benefits was we were able to use this data to evaluate the efficacy of drugs. Now, Vimorolone is a steroid type of drug which has been tested in Duchenne muscular dystrophy in a research study by the US group, and they had some initial benefit, and then they used this study in an open uh, extension study, they used the medicine. So they needed a comparison of those boys who were treated with Vimorolone as to with other children globally to see whether the Vimorolone was similar to a steroid treatment or worse or better. So in that situation, the some data from NOSTAR uh, group was used for comparison with the Vimorolone treated boys. And it showed that the Vimorolone treated boys physically were functioning as good as the corticosteroid treated boys in the NOSTAR group, which showed that if Vimorolone had a lower side effect profile, it was probably a good medicine because it was giving at least as much benefit as steroid. Now, I think that is a very positive contribution that we have brought towards evaluating a drug which may be of benefit to Duchenne muscular dystrophy tomorrow. New slide, please. So this is my final slide. And apart from both the clinical work and the academic work, there are two main areas that we are very actively working on at the moment. One is that we are working through focus groups uh, with the MD UK of trying to share some North Star ambulatory assessment score data with families in an appropriate format, which would enhance their understanding of the condition and why the treatment may be done. Now, this is a big subject which requires evaluation of how it would be done best without upsetting and with making the maximum yield and the benefit to the family. So that is an ongoing piece of work. The second is that we are developing a system whereby families may be able to input some outcomes data directly into the NOSTAR network database. For example, if a child has a chest infection or a fracture, they can input that data directly rather than wait six months to go to the clinic and then report it because sometimes the memory of the exactness of this is lost. So this will add strength to the database and to the cumulative data by having input. Clearly, these are foundations and they, there's a lot of benefit that can be built up in future on that. So I think I'll stop at that point. I think needless to say, I have to thank all the colleagues on the NHS which contribute uh, to this uh, NOSTAR network and data, uh, MDUK for the support, and most of all to the families who invariably have given their consent for their children's data to be used in the NOSTAR database. Thanks very, very much. Thanks, Adnan, for a wonderful talk. Um, it's really interesting to hear about North Star and um, uh, the progress that you've, you've been made, making there. Um, 
we don't have any questions in the Q and A, um, uh, so maybe I'll ask a, a few of my own. You mentioned um, working collaboratively and international academic collaborations. Can you tell us a bit more about how that works and the importance of um, international collaboration for North Star? I think uh, th thanks. Uh, very interesting question. Uh, the Broadly speaking, there are some international groups who have developed a very specific expertise in statistical analysis of the data. And those groups were initially funded by organizations like the uh, Muscle Industry Association of the United States. Uh, there has to be professional excellence, some independence, but in today's day, there is an interdependence from all parties like regulatory bodies, pharmaceuticals, academics, clinicians. Uh, so there are restraints about how much data we can share, what form of data we can share, that is across countries, across institutions. But within all these parameters, there's room for sharing anonymized data or summaries of anonymized data to get an overall maximum benefit. Uh, that, that's one. The second is that various academic groups plan studies of individual medication, which may be of potential benefit in Dushan Muscle Industry. They need to know how many subjects should they choose to put in a clinical trial because the number of subjects should be enough to be able to get a valid answer whether the drug would be beneficial or not. In statistical terms, that is called the power of the study. And the power of the study is based on the drug effect. How big is the drug effect? What is the difference in change that happens on the drug as compared to the difference in change that happens by natural history induction muscular dystrophy. And that change varies between young boys with Duchenne, middle-aged boys, non-ambulant boy, young people. So that is a way in which sometimes we get queries about, we have this project, what do you think will be the best number? Uh, how should we power our study? Uh, now, that is an area that is still developing. Uh, because on the one hand, it may look very easy, but it's technically difficult and time consuming. And there needs to be a resource for that. And uh, bigger groups who have an academic depth, I think they are very well suited. And this is the other beauty of North Star that we started as a group of clinicians on the NHS with some academics, which had part-time clinicians role. And everybody contributed in line with what we are doing. The academics cannot do without clinicians. The clinicians can't do it without the academics. We all need each other to really grow. The physiotherapists have to contribute, the physicians have to contribute, the dietitians have to contribute. And I think this is the beauty. Everybody has to be contributing to be able to get the data which is relevant. Interesting. Thank you so much for that answer. Uh, I see another uh, questions come through in the chat. Um, so the question is about um, Vermol Arone um, and uh, is asking in terms of a trial, uh, what are the advances and what is uh, the potential for future regulatory approval? Um, is, is, is that something that North Star are involved in? And can you comment on that, please? Yeah, so as one of the uh, last slides was, Remorolone is a drug which has been specifically formulated to have a steroid-like effect in Duchenne, but not have as many adverse effects. And the first clinical trial showed that it had some benefit and the extended study had the benefit. That's what we contributed to. Now, the next step is the company who uh, has the, uh, who, who manufactured the medication or uh, did the science, they are going to go to FDA 
and to European medicine agencies with their data. With these drugs, as uh, I think uh, the, the client, uh, the colleagues on this uh, and the families on this uh, group are very sophisticated. Each one of these drugs, the regulatory authorities view it. They may first give it an or orphan drug status, which means that yes, this is a drug of potential benefit, but needs to be proven. Then the regulatory bodies evaluate and say, is it safe? That's the first priority. The second is, how effective it is? Is it effective in the animal model? Is it effective in a petri dish in the laboratory? Is it effective in the human? And when it says effective in the human, they mean you give it to a patient and there's a benefit, which is slightly different. You give it to a muscle culture in a test tube and say more dystrophin is formed. And on that basis, the regulatory bodies give either a full approval that the drug is now registered as a drug, you can use it, or they give a provisional approval subject to further studies. So atelorin is a good example. It wasn't given FDA approval in the US because they were not sure of the efficacy. The European Medicines Agency said it's a drug of uh, good uh, use. Let's give it, but get the data to show, see the efficacy. And on that basis, it has been given. Now, I'm not sure, I'm sure Deflazacort manufacturers will go to, uh, to FDA and to the regulatory bodies. They have a program to do that. I, I'm, I'm not privy to the details of that, but what level of authorization they will get, it, is look, it looks very optimistic. And I'm, I think we, we should have optimism that this will come to clinical practice. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I think so. Another question's come through in the chat. It's a little on the clinical side for for the research section, but I think it's probably a fairly easy answer. Um, I'll ask you this question, and I think we'll we'll let you go after that. Um, but this question is again about uh, for um and reduction of appetite, um, uh, and is asking is is that something you regularly see with steroid use? I think the Steroids increase appetite and children put on huge weight. Now, Vimorolone is supposed to have less of that side effect. So the data on Vimorolone is available from the limited studies. At the moment in UK, there, were, there are a few children who were on the Vimorolone research study. After finishing the research study, they went on to what is called the compassionate use or extended period of a model on that basis. I think that data is extremely sparse, but the anticipation is that the Vimoral on adverse effects, whether it is appetite or weight gain or bone adverse effects will be less as compared to the regular steroids, prednisolone and defensive. Fantastic, thank you very much. So, um, Thank you, Adnan, for your presentation this morning. I'm, I'm, I'm particularly impressed that you've turned up with um, COVID and given this presentation. I'm sure I would be in bed um, not doing a presentation <laughs> at all. So uh, thanks for your contribution this morning. Uh, and now I think we will move on to uh, Linda Popplewell's presentation. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce Linda, who is the Professor of Molecular Therapies at the National Horizons Centre at Teesside University. She recently moved from Royal Holloway University of London, where she's been a researcher for 20 years. She first worked as a postdoctoral researcher in Professor George Dixon's lab, where she worked on gene therapy approaches that ultimately led to the development of the drug golodersin and other treatments that are now in clinical trials. Um, she achieved increasingly senior posts at Royal Holloway, um, becoming full prof professor in 2021. During her time at Royal Holloway, uh, Professor Propperwell worked on preclinical development of gene therapies for neuromuscular conditions with a particular focus on Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Her interests include vector-mediated gene addition, endonucleate-mediated gene editing, antisense oligonucleotide for exon skipping, and gene silencing approaches. But this morning, Professor Popplewell will, will talk about methods for targeting fibrosis, which occurs in the muscles of people with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So welcome, Linda. I'll hand over to you now for your presentation. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for the kind invitation and for the, um, to be involved in this Muscle Matters. It's really exciting to be part of this. So yeah, as John's already said, um, I was at Royal Holloway until very recently, and we have an exciting uh, PhD project funded by MD UK, looking at trying to target the fibrosis seen in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, so I'll take you through some of the data in a uh, you know, short time. Uh, so this is four years of work, but I'll give you the highlights. Okay, next slide, please. I should say that this work was performed by a PhD student, like I say, Victoria Sonasova, and I noticed when I was going through the slides that I haven't acknowledged her anywhere, which is really bad, but she did all of this work and she was a fantastic research um, student. So I think we've skipped a few slides for some reason, um, but I'll go with where we are. <laughs> um, so yeah, so at Royal Holloway, we developed a microdystrophin. Uh, so you, some of you may already be aware that microdystrophins are in clinical trial. Um, they, they work, they seem to be producing some exciting results. So we've had to use microdystrophins because the um, DNA carriers that we use um, can only carry a certain size of DNA. So we've got rid of the middle section of the dystrophin and have the important ends uh, so that it's functional. Uh, so there are various microdystrophins in trial. The one that was developed at Royal Holloway um, has been injected into a boy and um, MDUK were instrumental in getting RMDU1 into trial. And it's um, exciting times um, in terms of gene therapies for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Now, the thing is with um, um, any gene therapy for muscle disease, um, the disease process results in fibrosis of the muscle so that the um, muscle available um, for treatment is reduced quality. So they may not work as well as they might do if there was no fibrosis. So that's why we chose to target um, the fibrosis associated with Duchenne. Uh, next slide, please. So we chose to target periostin as part of this. So don't worry too much about all the detail on this slide, but basically periostin is in the middle of a number of pathways, as you can see on the left there. So by targeting this, we can hopefully uh, stop the fibrosis. And other people have looked at doing that in other tissues, so not related to skeletal muscle, and they show that targeting the periostin does reduce the fibrosis. There has been a couple of studies looking at skeletal muscle. So this is in mouse models. Um, and you can see a highlight from a paper here of some graphs. So it's a different type of muscular dystrophy. Um, and you can see in the black bars that the percentage of fibrosis is high across um, various muscles. Uh, but when they knock out periostin, so they genetically knock it out, so there's no periostin expressed, then the levels of fibrosis are reduced. So it does look like a good target. Next slide, please. So there are various aims. Um, I won't take you through all the work, but um, the idea was that we would use an antibody to block uh, the periostin. So an antibody binds to its target and then masks it. So it can't interact with the other proteins that it normally interacts with. So we can block periostin with an antibody. So I should mention that there was a really important industrial partner involved in this work. So they had a, a panel of over 100 antibodies to periostin, and they were very excited to be able to test it against skeletal muscle fibrosis. So we worked with them to screen um, an antibody. So, um, could only take one forward to testing in a mouse model. So as for any medicine, it has to go through cell testing and then animal testing. So we used a fibrotic uh, model of Duchenne, a mouse model, and looked at various outcomes to see how effective blocking periostin with an antibody would be. Uh, but first, Victoria looked at different forms of periostin. So on the next slide, um, please, the next slide. Uh, so there are various forms of periostin expressed, uh, which complicates matters, and they have different roles. Um, so the, they are different lengths, and they've got different um, end, basically, so that they have different functions. And it, so there's five different forms of periostin expressed, and two of them 
Uh, the ones that contain what's called exon 17 seem to be the ones that are involved in fibrosis, while the other three that don't have exon 17 don't um, cause fibrosis. Uh, so no one has looked previously at skeletal muscle and what the various forms of periostin um, expression looks like and in relation to Duchenne. So no one's looked at that. So that was the first thing Victoria did. So on the next slide, <clears throat> she looked at different aged mice. So there's the standard mouse model of Duchenne called the MDX mouse. And it shows um, severe fibrosis in the diaphragm, the respiratory muscle um, with aging. And you can see that when she looked at the levels of periostin, you know, from three months to 12 months of age, there was the total periostin in the top graph. Uh, it was increased in the MDX mouse compared to control. But then when she specifically looked at the ones, uh, the periostin that contained exon 17, those levels increased um, with aging. So that's the bottom graph there. So the red bar is the MDX versus the black, the control mouse. So it does look like the exon 17 periostin is the key fibrotic factor in skeletal muscles. So no one's reported this before, so it's a really important finding. Um, next slide. And uh, so as I say, there were hundreds of antibodies available from our partner, so we could only take one forward. So the best was selected um, from uh, the panel, um, from cell work, and then injected into this uh, severely fibrotic model called the DBA2 MDX. So we did a, um, a comparison study to a control antibody, and also with and without the AAV microdystrophin. We did various assessments through the treatment and then looked at how the muscle appeared down a microscope at the end. Uh, next slide. So this, I'm not gonna show you all the data, but I'll show you the highlights. So first thing we looked at um, down the microscope was the size of the fibers. Uh, so this is looking down the length of the fiber in the sections you can see at the bottom there and me measuring their size. So on the graph on the right, uh, you'll see that, sorry, it's, uh, you can't see the, the legend for the graph, but I'll take you through it. So in the purple line, uh, that's the um, MDX mouse treated with the control antibody. And you can see that the fibers are all of fairly small size compared to the control mouse, which is shown in the black line. So the black line, the fibers are bigger. Uh, so there's a clear difference. And you'll see that the periostin, periostin antibody on its own in the red line isn't improving um, the fiber size back to control. While the, the mice treated with the AAV, um, microdystrophin shown in the green bar, uh, there is a drop in the size of um, in the number of fibers that are small and a shift towards those that are bigger, which is important. So it shows that the microdystrophin is protecting the muscle from turnover, which is what happens when the muscle gets damaged during contraction and then repaired. So the fact that the periostin antibody isn't doing anything on its own is logical because we're not restoring dystrophin, while the uh, microdystrophin is obviously uh, protecting the muscle. But you'll notice in the purple bar, uh, purple line, which is where we've got a combination of the AAV microdystrophin and also the periostin antibody that we've got a further decrease in the small fibers, um, which uh, implies that the combination effect is beneficial. So this is really exciting. Next slide, please. So then we looked at, um, sorry, I think missed a slide. Um, can we go back a second, is that all right? No, okay, um, so I'll go with the next slide then. So we also looked at the expression of different fibrosis genes. Uh, so there's a selection here that um, shows some really positive um, outputs. So again, in the purple bar, it's the mice treated with the control antibody, and we're comparing against the wild type in the black. So you can see that there's high levels of expression of the fibrotic genes. And when we treat with the periostin antibody, 
there is um, a decrease in the levels of those genes being expressed. So the periostin antibody is doing what we expect and inhibiting fibrosis. So this is all very encouraging. Next slide, please. Um, so how is the muscle behaving? So we did a number of um, measurements um, during treatment. So before treatment and then at the end of treatment. And the thing to note here is the time for fatigue slide um, graph on the right. Um, so you can see the legend there. So um, the thing to note is what's shown with the um, control antibody. You can see that the five to six week assessment that's before treatment and the 12 to 13 week that's after treatment, there's no improvements. So the time for fatigue is measured by putting the mice on a treadmill and just basically measuring how long they can run for. So there's no improvement in with the control antibody, but you can see in the red lines um, where we're treating with the periostin antibody that there is an improvement and it goes back to what's seen in the wild type mice in the black bars. So this is really, really encouraging. Um, next slide, please. We then looked at um, the resistance of the muscle to fatigue. So this is a standard a technique used in mouse studies. So basically you measure, you cause the muscle to contract and you measure the force that it can generate and you do repeat contractions. And in a dystrophic muscle, the force it can generate decreases with each contraction. And you can see that in the purple line, which is the mice treated with an isotype control. So you can see there's a, a steady decline with each contraction while in the wild type mouse and the black line, um, it stays level. Um, and the exciting thing to note is that our periostin antibody on its own is improving uh, the resistance to fatigue in uh, the treated mice. So it looks like it's of benefit, which is really exciting. Next slide. Um, so again, you've missed, I missed a slide. So, um, so the idea is that this uh, periostin antibody has potential. Um, we do need to do further studies. We probably need to do a dose escalation and also use lower AAV microdystrophin because the ideal would be that for patients um, that they would get a lower dose of AAV and avoid the adverse toxic effects that are being seen in trial. And also we can use the antibody prior to the AAV to protect the muscle from damage to try and improve the outcome measures. Uh, so we think this antibody has potential and uh, we'd like to take the work forward. We also have a project in the lab uh, looking at targeting exon 17, so the, the part of the protein that seems to be responsible for fibrosis with an antisense oligonucleotide. So some of you may know about the exon skipping for restoring uh, dystrophin expression. So here we can use the same sort of DNA patches to induce the skipping of exon 17 and convert the periostin from fibrotic to non-fibrotic. So, and again, we've recently got an MDUK grant to carry on this work, so it's really exciting. And we're so thankful to MDUK for all their support of the work that we do. Um, I'd like to thank everyone in the lab and particularly Victoria, and like I say, I've left her name off, but she has been a fantastic student and she's in the process of just doing her corrections on her thesis and then she'll be a doctor and be um, maybe doing some more research into Duchenne, which will be really exciting. I'd like to thank the industrial partner um, and the supervisor there because this work obviously wouldn't have been possible without them. And thank you for listening. Thanks, Linda. That was a great talk. Um, my apologies to everybody for the technical difficulties with uh, Linda's slides. Um, uh, I'm not sure what happened there. Um, so, Linda, maybe um, I've noticed there is a question in the chat, but I think maybe it's a little clinical. So that will carry over into the living well section and we'll get answered a little <laughs> bit later. Um, I think maybe I'd like to start with a slightly broad question but a lot of this work is based on um, use of animal models and, uh, and there was quite an extensive um, discussion of use of animal models in uh, research into neuromuscular diseases the last year's uh, world muscle society meeting um, 
just maybe a, a broad comment on uh, use of animals here and the the power of um, Duchenne models like MDX and uh, and where you think that might be going in the field. Yeah, no, that's a really good question, and it's a really important question because you know, using animals in any research is you know sensitive. Everything we do is approved and is on a license. But the trouble is, you know, if we could do it in cells, it would be perfect. But cells don't reproduce how muscles are. Uh, so everything needs to be screened in an, an animal model, unfortunately. We do all we can um, in cells. So like I say, we screened all the antibodies first in cells in a dish and then only took the best forward. And we keep the numbers um, of the mice in the study as small as possible and they're really well looked after. So I, I appreciate it is um, not nice to think that animals are being used, but I think it is key to, for anything to then get into patients because you need to show that it's a benefit because um, otherwise, you know, your trial um, won't be founded or any, on anything scientific. Uh, so where the field is going, I think people are working on trying to generate what are called 3D organoids for muscles. So that's basically... So normally in cell culture, the cells just grow in one layer. Uh, people are working to develop what are called 3D. So it's making three dimensional muscle. Uh, but muscle is very, very difficult to grow in three dimensions because you need really good uh, supply of nutrients to keep it alive. So it is very difficult, uh, but people are working on that. And I can see that that will come into replacing some of the animal work. Um, so for fibrosis, um, it's hard to reproduce fibrosis in a dish as well because you need lots of different cells. So that's why you need the whole muscle in an animal to be able to test any antibiotic. Um, hopefully that's answered what you were asking. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, going back to your periostin story, um, interesting protein and, and, and clearly uh, has potential to be key for um, treatment in, in Duchenne. Um, I might have missed this in your talk, but is, is periostin kind of evenly expressed across muscle? Um, and do you, do you envisage perhaps as this rolls out into the clinical, is this going to be a systemic treatment trying to target all muscles or or are there, or is there distribution of periostin that might need to be targeted differently in some way? That's a brilliant question. <laughs> um, so periostin is normally just expressed in um, teeth and ligaments. Um, so it's only expressed in response to injury to sort of mastermind the repair as it were. So, you know, in Duchenne, we're obviously wanting to target the muscle. Um, so it's, it's expressed in development in teeth and ligaments, like I say. So it's not a protein that's generally expressed everywhere. But because of Duchenne, we know that all the muscles are compromised. So we would want to do a systemic treatment with periostin antibody. And using an antibody uh, means that we can withdraw treatment um, in times of need you know if there is an injury somewhere else with a different tissue we do still want the repair to happen there so using a therapy that can be removed is really important but it would be a systemic delivery and uh, periostin is carried in the blood as well uh, so we would um, need to make sure we're getting to the muscle so we think we will need a higher dose of the antibody so that's what i'm saying in the mouse model we maybe didn't go in with a high enough dose because of the levels of uh, periostin around the body, but knocking it out transiently or blocking it transiently shouldn't be an issue uh, because we can remove the treatment. That's why an antibody is very, um, you know, a good thing to be developing. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so I think we're approaching the hour. One, one last question from me. Um, so I, I, I think it's clear that there are a lot of researchers who are looking at different aspects of both the improvement of gene therapy mm -hmm. um, and looking at other aspects of Duchenne that they might target. So again, as this rolls out into the clinical, do you envisage 
maybe this being a battery of different approaches with gene therapy, um, replacing dystrophin, um, perhaps targeting periostin, and maybe some other mechanisms. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I think it's generally acknowledged that it's likely a combination treatment will be the ideal for Duchenne. So I think, you know, it's not just fibrosis, there's also the muscle wasting. So again, at Royal Holloway, we've been developing an antisense, one of these DNA patches to myostatin. Um, so I think, you know, you could end up with a three treatment. So one that restores dystrophin, one that stops the muscle wasting, and one that stops fibrosis. It might be that you won't have all three at once, but you might have initially something to stop the wasting and the fibrosis. And then once you stabilize the muscle, then you go in with the dystrophin restoration. Uh, so I think it, you know, it's going to take a time to figure out the best timings and also the best combinations. Um, and also there's going to have to be trials of each combination. But I think at some point it will be um, a triple whammy, as it were, to try and address all the phenotypes associated with Duchenne. Right. Um, we are we are now approaching the hour. I think um, uh, we uh, should thank Linda now uh, for a great talk. Um, I think Annan's gone, but I want to thank Annan as well. Um, and that brings the research session to a close. I'm going to hand back to Rob now, who's going to tell us something about uh, Translana and uh, who will then chair the Living Wealth session. Thank you. Thank you, John. And yeah, just to echo, um, John, thanks to Linda and Adnan. I really appreciate your time with us this morning. Um, yeah, this is a very timely session. I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes um, updating on where the NICE appraisal of the treatment Translana or Atalurin um, is at. Um, Adnan mentioned that uh, in his um, North Star session as well, because um, North Star has played a, a key role there. Um, the reason it's very timely is because NICE are actually meeting tomorrow um, to uh, discuss the treatment in the sort of the next stage of the appraisal. So um, Translana or Atalurin um, is a treatment for nonsense, um, a nonsense mutation of uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So it's not a treatment for, for all, all people um, with Duchenne. Um, it's been available for coming up to six years now on the NHS through something called a managed access agreement. Now, a managed access agreement is a system by which essentially uh, NICE said um, five and a half, six years ago that they were convinced that it was a treatment that had a benefit, but that because um, the uh, evidence was quite a low base because of the number of people it was uh, relevant to and the number of people who had been involved in clinical trials, they wanted to see more evidence. So a managed access agreement is a way of making a treatment available while also collecting further evidence to then make a longer term decision. Um, they're increasingly being used um, by NICE, um, which is reflective, I think, of the uh, progress that's being made in developing treatments for <clears throat> rare conditions. So as more and more treatments are developed for rarer conditions, which have a low number, a relatively low number of people affected, we're seeing more of these managed access agreements being used. We're active on, on several, actually, uh, that cover SMA as well. But I think Translana was one of the first MAAs in use by the NHS and by NICE. Um, so that MAA comes uh, to an end in January of 2023. It was extended by a year primarily due to COVID. Um, so that's why the NICE appraisal process is now uh, at its final stage so that by the time the MAA comes to a close, there's clarity on what will be the long-term um, future of uh, availability of, uh, uh, of the treatment. Um, so the appraisal meeting tomorrow is that is, is uh, MD UK has been very active on this treatment throughout that five or six years. So we're a member of what's called the Managed Access Oversight Group. And we work closely in partnership with Action Duchenne and with um, patients and families as well. And we have been throughout the process. We've been engaged for the past year um, in the run up to tomorrow's committee meeting. We've submitted um, various um, pieces of evidence, um, as have the company PTC and as have clinicians as well. Um, so tomorrow the committee meets to um, really hear directly from us as patient experts. So um, we'll be attending as a patient expert alongside um, two Duchenne parents who have experience of their children um, taking the treatment. The company will also be there as will expert clinicians. The committee will then um, uh, discuss uh, what's said at the meeting as well as um, information that's confidential from the company and from NHS England around 
price and availability and over the and a few weeks after tomorrow's committee meeting we'll get an indication as to whether what the committee's view is there are two possible outcomes at this stage um so the the first outcome which is obviously the one we're, we're hoping for is an is a yes that um the evidence that NISA are are convinced that actually the evidence both from the maa itself um, but also from other sources um has shown that the uh, treatment should be made permanently available on the nhs there'll be a big role there um, as well in terms of cost effectiveness and the role the company plays on things like price. So it won't just be what's said at the committee meeting tomorrow that's relevant. So hopefully it will be a, a yes. However, at this stage, a no is not uncommon, um, but often a no at this stage converts to a yes at a later stage. So um, if it is a no, which we'll find out in a, so several weeks, we don't know the time frame, but it'll be several weeks after the committee meeting, there'll be a public consultation and NICE will, will outline uh, in official documents what why they have said no at this stage so there'll be a chance for people to input their views and we will certainly be mobilizing around that we feel there's a very strong um case for the treatments we made available um, we ran several surveys during the process and one just recently um to reiterate the impact that um access to Translana has both on the on the people taking it but on their families and carers as well so we, we feel very strongly that we will be making a strong case should it be a no we'll be definitely mobilizing the community around um that consultation um but i guess the key message here is that if it is a no at this stage that it, it's that isn't uncommon with these kind of treatments and often that is then converted to a yes through the public consultation so we will we'll be quite pragmatic about it if it is a no um the final thing um i'll say on on this i think is that um in terms of people who are currently receiving um Atalura or Translana through the managed access agreement the NHS England and NICE have agreed that whatever the outcome of the NICE appraisal so even if it is a no anyone on the managed access agreement can continue to receive Translana beyond January so they'll continue to have access to the treatment and that will be at the discretion of their clinician um so it's, that's positive news for anybody on the treatment if it were to be no we're obviously hoping that doesn't happen but in the worst case scenario people currently in receipt of Translana will still be able to access the treatment um I think it's really important to thank everybody who's been involved in the process um including um Adnan and the team at North Star of course but also all all clinicians who've been involved all patients and families who've submitted um their views via our surveys and we'll be calling on you again if we need to for the public consultation so anybody on the on this call who who um, has submitted anything and if you have experience with Transana thank you very much because it has made a huge impact um on 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 the case we're taking um before i move into the living well section we had a really good question that came through in the research section asking if there was yet a perfect treatment for duchenne the, the answer is 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 no there is no um sort of single treatment or, or cure for for duchenne um but what are being developed are a number of different treatments so translan is the only treatment um available in the, in this way so on the nhs even though through an maa at the moment but obviously that's only for a small group of people living with Duchenne and also it, it, it sort of slows progression of the of the condition as opposed to um, uh, being reversing it or, or being a cure as Linda said in her her talk what what's more likely is there'll be treatments that come through in combination so you'll be able to treat different elements of of Duchenne um, but no there is no perfect cure at the moment or or, or perfect treatment um but obviously that's the aim and the long-term vision for for all research into these conditions is to is to find that that cure and those treatments so i hope that answers that question um so i'm very happy to take questions on that through the q a section as, as part of the living well section but i will now welcome our next set of panelists so um bear with me while i get the right document up this is always the problem of um speaking and chairing at the same time um so bear with me for two seconds um so i'm delighted to welcome our um three um uh, latest panelists um sean ball priya mystery and my colleague romla kadir um sean ball is a neuromuscular care advisor at sheffield children's nhs foundation trust um she qualified as an occupational therapist uh, in 1983 and her employment has been in the nhs social care and in voluntary organizations and her roles have included both clinical and management positions and she's also contributed to publications and presented at national training events for allied health professionals um, she took the opportunity whilst working as an OT of joining the neuromuscular team in 2018 uh, as, a, as a kind of part-time basis but that's now become she's now a full-time member of the um of the team um specializing in neuromuscular conditions so welcome Sean um 
Priya Mistry has been working as a paediatric dietitian for seven years with a variety of experience, including general paediatrics, allergy, gastroenterology, cystic fibrosis and oncology, and also bone marrow transplant. Um, she's currently working as a, a rotational paediatric dietitian at Great Ormond Street within the neuro rotation. And finally, my colleague Romla Kadir has been a helpline information and advocacy officer within the care and support team here at MD UK for, for nearly a year now. Um, during that time, Romla has responded to hundreds of requests for support coming in through email or through the helpline and has worked on advocacy cases in topics relating to welfare, housing and care. Um, Romla has also now started to attend neuromuscular clinics twice a month at Royal London Hospital so that MD UK can provide practical support to their patients there. Um, Romla has a muscle wasting condition herself and has always been been interested in disability rights, activism through shared experiences, and ensuring access to services for as many people as possible. So welcome to the three of you. Um, Sean, if I could come to you first, it'd be great just to hear um, a bit of an overview of what the care advisor role is, and also maybe provide some examples of the kind of support that you provide to children and families with Duchenne. Yes, of course, of course, Rob. Um, first of all, I just want, wanted to say that um, I'm delighted to have been uh, invited to have been part of this panel today. Um, and I really thought the title Living with DMD really sums everything up. Um, Living with DMD, it's fantastic knowing about all these research opportunities, etc., and what the future may hold. But living with DMD is a day to day support. It not only affects the youngster uh, who's under our care, but it also affects the whole of the family, including siblings as well. Um, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a background of our very briefly of our service up here in Sheffield. Um, at the current time, we've got a cohort of uh, 50 odd plus um, families who belong to our service. Our ages of uh, youngsters who are in our service are right from preschool, at, for instance, at diagnosis and right the way through to transition into um, adult neuromuscular care here in Sheffield. Um, our geographical area that we cover is huge, um, both in terms of uh, population size, diversity and also culture. Um, just to put things in context for people who are not familiar with the North, we cover the city of Sheffield, um, all of South Yorkshire, which includes conurbations of Barnsley, Rotherham and Doncaster. We go across to Lincolnshire to the coast, stretching from Grimsby down to Boston and then back across again to North Derbyshire. We butt up to our colleagues in Leeds um, um, in the north and Manchester to the west and Derby to the, to, um, the south, including Nottingham. My remit is vast. I, I'm delighted to be part of a, of a very close working neuromuscular team, along with our um, neurologist consultants, our neuromuscular physiotherapists, our advanced nurse practitioner, and um, a psychologist as well. My remit is I offer diagnosis support first and foremost, and then I'm there right the way through um, the youngsters' childhood into their teenage years, offering support to them and their family. Um, I wanted to pick out three points, um, I might add on another one actually as well, but three points when I was thinking about how I could just sort of sum up what I do and what's been really important over this, this last little while in, in my working practices. Here um, we have um, EHCPs, which are educational healthcare plans for youngsters uh, with disabilities who are um, going into school and those plans stay with them right the way through until they go into college and leave college. Part of my remit is um, helping the schools to understand this diagnosis. Um, they may never have had a pupil with DMD prior to, to this, this youngster going in. We're looking at the importance of early preparation for the schools and then planning for the future needs. So that is really, really important part of my remit. Um, I've also been heavily involved recently with support um, with appeals to the DWP, Department of Work and Pensions, for attendance allowance rejections for um, youngsters um, having Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And it, for me, it would seem absurd that a um, debilitating condition as this can be rejected. But recently, and I'm talking of the last year or so, the number of rejections and appeals that I've been involved with has ballooned out of all proportion to my previous working um, experiences. Um, the third point I wanted to raise as well, how much for me and also for our families is the importance of information about activities and pastimes which their youngster can be um, involved in and participate in with a whole family as well. 
We want to look at buddying up opportunities um, with youngsters of a similar age as well, because sometimes, again, this condition is very isolating. And that support that you can gain, not from just within your family, but from outside your family as well is all very important. So those are the three, three areas I just wanted to pick out of the year to be able to just lay the grounding from what I talk about when I look at living with DMD. Sean, thank you very much. That was a fantastic overview of the role of the care advisor and the sort of the kind of hot topics you're dealing with at the yeah. moment. I think so. I'm sure some of the access to benefits stuff in particular, Romney will pick up as well in terms of the, our role and and our experience of that. Um, I had a, a cheeky follow up question, which is that um, working with care advisors, I've come across uh, it's not uncommon for care advisors to have a an occupational therapist background. So is that does that help you in your role? Do you think? And what, why why is that quite common? Because I know that care advisors come from a variety of backgrounds, but I'm just conscious that that that's that's a fairly common one. Yes, it is. Um, I'm, uh, I feel I use my occupational therapist background, which is all about looking at day-to-day um, -day living and practical advice, etc., cetera, um, in every aspect of my work that I do um, with these children and young people. Um, we were, also, we're also a very holistic profession anyway by, by background. We don't just look at the leg. We don't just look at the arm, etc. We look at the whole person and also we look at participation in activities. So to me, being an OT is part and parcel of being a, a care advisor as well. They go hand in hand. They really go well together. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Pierre, I'll come to you now. I think, And also I think you're dealing very, very well with, um, I think, automatic light issues <laughs> in, your, in your room. So well done. <laughs> just keep moving, I think, is the key, isn't it? Um, could you could you explain a bit about your role as a dietitian and why it's such an important part of a neuromuscular team? And in particular, um, why support from a dietitian is so important for a child with Duchenne? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so thank you again for inviting me to speak today and be part of um, today's talk. Um, so from a dietitian perspective, um, we often have referrals um, just because as we've touched on earlier, just with the, the condition of DMD, it's like a, a muscle strength um, sort of deterioration over time. And um, part of the treatment is with the use of steroids. Um, and with the use of steroids, you'll often see increased appetite. And so our role um, includes trying to make sure that we are preventing very rapid weight gain or how we can manage at least sort of maintaining weight or slowing down or aiming for like steady weight gain um, because often these children will um, have then over time as their muscles deteriorate um, unfortunately their sort of physical activity levels reduce as well so then if you've got an increased appetite and um, reduced physical activity you're just going to start to put on weight so my role would be to do a nutritional assessment um, look at their growth chart see the anthropo anthropometry um look at like the when did the weight start to you know pile on um and you'll mostly find that it was when the steroid use um began and then just thinking about a nutritional assessment um so just gaining a diet history what is, what is that child sort of eating habits on a day-to-day -day basis um alongside you know what what sort of um goes hand in hand with family as well um, and then just thinking about and discussing um, what would work for the family what sort of small changes can we make um, whether it's like cooking methods um, changing you know certain foods in the diet as alternatives um, and I quite like cooking baking myself so some of these suggestions um, I really do enjoy and I come and I try to really ask the parent because it's mainly speaking to the parents and the carers about what their child likes what are they willing to um you know try or substitute um because it's all well I can give like a whole plan but it has to be um you know sort of tailored to the patient um and then following on from a nutritional assessment um I'll also sort of look at biochemistry so sorry <laughs> um also like looking at nutritional bloods because it's really important that um 
you know, that, that these children aren't deficient in anything. Um, but you do often find that they their bone profile, vitamin D levels are low. Um, so just making sure that it has any supplementation started um, for that if there are very low levels. Um, and then if there are any sort of dietary supplements we can use as well, um, you know, if it's quite limited. So it's a combination of dietary, but also supplementation if it's really low. Um, and then just like Sean, actually, so I know um, I may often, I just say, oh, I'm just a dietitian, but we do, I think, as healthcare professionals, have a quite holistic approach and a mindset when treating patients. Um, and so even though, um, like, we have, like, a little template that we use, because I just do a telephone clinic um, for this, for neuromuscular clinic. Um, and so often I will I will ask as well, what is the, like, the physical activity um, side with the patient? Are they able to walk? Are they able to, or are they not? able to what are their bed bound um or and often asking these questions really helps because often the parent will inform me that their child actually you know for example is doing upper body um exercises just even like throwing like a stress ball or a ball with their parent um and it's just sort of that movement as well and again that just helps um you know just with keeping their weight stable or doing some sort of activity and whether it's inside or outside um walking as well you find what I'm finding is that children as they're getting in those different sort of age brackets is that um they might sort of be able to walk but then they tire easily um and that sort of deterioration happens as they're getting older throughout their condition as well so it's just about doing things that they can do um that suits them in a time frame as well and maybe doing it in short breaks um and then thinking about swallow as well so um, as I mentioned, because muscle deterioration is part of um, DMD, um, when often um, parents will advise me that their child was eating and now they're finding it difficult or, um, you know, they've moved on from perhaps normal textures to um, blended diet or puree without sort of any input, just I uh, find this out through my initial um, assessment. So if that's the case and I'm concerned, I may actually ask the consultant or whoever's referred that patient to me to consider a speech and language therapy assessment, um, just because we want their, if they do have an unsafe swallow, um, it's good to sort of have input um, formally and they can then be guided and advised on what textures to have. And that's really important because I will then need to make sure that they're getting and reaching their nutritional requirements that they need. And then touching on nutritional requirements, um, when I'm thinking about um, trying to maintain patient's weight or slowing down the weight gain, so instead of getting really quickly like this, you kind of want to maintain sort of the growth like that. Um, and because these children have limited physical activity or it's reducing or nil at all um i often use so I work out their nutritional requirements based on their age and weight but then because they may have physical activity reduced physical activity levels we sort of take off as a percentage for their age um, because they don't need as much energy say as a normal child without dmd so we take that into account as well um, and then, yeah, we'd go through advice and then um, often I'm having to use interpreters as well. So that can be quite challenging. Um, and then I'll just sort of send letters and resources off after the clinic. Um, so, yeah, that's that's my input. Thank you, Pri. That's that's fantastic. Um, you you've actually started to answer a question that came in while you were talking, oh. which is which is great. But I'm going to I'll I think it's an, another element to it. And I'll bring in Sean as well so that. Um, we haven't got a physio with us today, but the question is specifically around how can non-ambulant children, uh, what can they do to keep active and avoid weight gain? So obviously diet's a key, a key area, but do you also give a bit of advice on, on what, what exercise you spoke about, people um, doing upper body exercises? Um, so yeah, whether, whether you want to add to that and then, and Sean, if I could bring you in as well, if you've got any, you, you provide any advice on that. Um, yeah, of course. So um, again, it depends on when I do my assessment over the phone, what is their physical activity like? What are they doing? And then based on that, I may give some advice. Um, sorry. Um, so yeah, whether it's just like if they're sort of wheelchair bound, the upper body, if not, um, just like sort of some small short walks, um, doing things around the house and um, even little things like um, 
getting involved with meal times, so like doing some chopping, doing some peeling, things like that as well. But what they can manage, I always try to implement those things. And it also allows the child to know what they're eating, what they're adding, um, and also have a contribution to meal time prep and the menu throughout the week. Um, so yeah, it's a combination. Um, but I'll pass it over to Sean now. Yeah, um, yes, indeed. I've just put down a couple of things because um, there's wheelchair football, for instance, some of our DMD youngsters up here are, are involved in local wheelchair football teams. So they, they use their powered wheelchairs to participate in that. Um, there's hydrotherapy opportunities as well. Um, if uh, the youngster is lucky enough um, to be under uh, care of an NHS trust or wherever that does have hydrotherapy facilities, that is really brilliant. There's nothing better than getting in the water and just letting the water move your limbs. Um, and it's in a way it's a bit of restrictive exercise, but, but that 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 is really good as well. Um, and any sort of participatory activity, um, even as I say, even if it's if it, as um, you, you were saying, Perry, if, if it's just sort of upper limb work or or anything that involves rather than just pure exercise, because that can be looked upon as such such a, a boring way to go about things yes we do have to do passive movements etc but participation is is all all encompassing and i would heartily recommend that for for all our youngsters brilliant thank thank you both um i'm gonna um bring in romla now so um romla welcome i think this is your first um, session as a panelist um could you give us a flavor of some of the ways that you and the team are able to support people affected by muscle waste conditions i know that um, Sean mentioned access to benefits, for example, um, and perhaps some of the more common issues that families with Duchenne might come to us with. Of course, yeah. So I'm a part of the information and support team at MD UK, and me and my colleagues were able to support in a variety of ways. And these can include things like providing general information on conditions through our fact sheets, um, helping you get what you're entitled to by advising about welfare applications, or things like funding grants for home adaptations or equipment, for example. Um, we're also able to link you in with peer support networks, which are very beneficial for a lot of parents who can speak to others that have gone through similar things or um, are in a similar situation. And there's also like a more informal parent Facebook group as well that is moderated by MD UK that we always recommend. Um, families with children with Duchenne typically benefit from all these things I've already mentioned, but I guess some more common things could be in regard to housing adaptations or funding for equipment such as certain types of hoists, swivel seats or powered wheelchairs as their condition progresses and individuals need to prepare for the future. Um, in terms of powered wheelchairs particularly, we have the Joseph Patrick Trust grant scheme, which is the MD UK that we always recommend. and we can be contacted by individuals or parents if they have any issues with services or perhaps some equipment cannot be funded by the local authority and we're always happy to advise on what options are available. Um, another common topic that was already mentioned is applying for disability living allowance, which is the benefit for children under 16 um, and then PIP is the one for anyone over 16. And um, this is quite common because it can be <clears throat> it can be quite a daunting process and some people may find um, completing the form a bit overwhelming or just quite tricky to know whether they're doing it correctly. So this is something that we're always keen to talk people through and just reassure them that they are completing it correctly, either with our help or after they've done it already. And, and we're also very keen to support individuals who are challenging an unsuccessful decision or if you're unhappy about the rates awarded to, and typically we do this by um, advising you over the phone and um, supplying you with a letter of support to um, send over to the DWP as part of your mandatory reconsideration or tribunal, depending on what stage you're at. And getting DLA can allow access to further services such as motivability. So we do understand the importance this can have for many families and young people. Uh, one more thing that we do as part of our team is we supply alert cards and these we have for quite a variety of different neuromuscular conditions, of course, including Duchenne and this card, it looks a bit like this. So it's a folding out card, it's got some general information about the condition and um, just anything useful in an emergency or just every day if you need to explain your condition to anybody that you're encountering. Um, and these alert cards can be ordered via the website or by emailing the info inbox. 
And we also have other things like housing adaptations guides and education guides that we're very happy to share and post out with anyone that's interested. They're also available on our, on our website too. Um, so those are just a few examples of what we encounter regularly, but we're always happy to answer any other questions or um, assist as much as we can. And if we can't assist with the question, we're always happy to signpost to other organizations or places that we can, because we do have a good like, knowledge of what else is available for individuals. Brilliant. Thank, thanks so much, Romland. And I know that actually the, the team, you and the two have had a particularly busy period. I know that August, we I think we supported 255 people through the helpline in just that one month alone, which is one of our most busiest months we've had. And August is traditionally a quiet period um, as people go away. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see um, what happens in September and October in terms of the volume of people coming through. So so thank you for everything you do. And that's a great overview of what's available. Um, I've got a question, um, I think I think particularly for, for Sean, but then bringing in, in Priya, which is around, Sean, you mentioned... Um, a little bit about transition already actually someone someone fed in a question in advance about as some as a child approaches adulthood and moving into adult services how, how do you work with them and the family to transition them to adult services and, and what differences might they experience um rob if i may just answer that um but comment uh, in the local area that i work because that that's the that's the, the only one that i can yeah, comment on um just to put things in the picture in our uh, pediatric neuromuscular service here in sheffield which is part of the sheffield children's nhs foundation trust we have really close links with our adult um, nhs provider for neuromuscular services which is the sheffield teaching hospitals nhs foundation trust so we're two separate entities but we do work very closely together um we uh prepare, if that's the best, best word to use, prepare youngsters and families. Um, think when we think and begin talking about transition, really it can be as early as really from the age of 14 years where we begin to set the scene um, and help in that sort of that, that pathway, I hate to use the word pathway, but that pathway towards transition into adult health services. Um, so that's done very informally at, at clinic appointments, et cetera, where we begin talking about adult health care and how that would how that works here in Sheffield. And then as the time approaches, it's that there isn't a set um, age at all. It really depends on individual circumstances, individual health at the time. But what we do have here in Sheffield are um, transition clinics where we have a, a jointly held clinics bet between the paediatric team and the adult team and whereby the youngster and family are invited to that clinic appointment so that they can face to face meet the adult team discuss concerns and that really is is helping that process to work its way through to when that youngster then becomes a fully fledged adult in in adult health care that's how we do it in Sheffield and um it works comparatively well all things considered thank you Sean that's really helpful I think um Throughout this whole session, including from from Adnan onwards, that the that that theme of partnership between the professionals who are supporting people has been has been really strong, which sort of leads me to the next question. You mentioned partnership between paediatric and adult services. Um, just be really interested in your view, but also then Priya's view as another member of of that team about kind of how, why it's so important that you have that multidisciplinary team and how I know you're from different services, but how within your service you um, sort of liaise around a, a single patient and family. Because I think what I found fascinating is just that the huge network of support that has to be built around someone living with a muscle waste condition. If I could come to you again first, Sean, and then, and then and hear Priya's sort of take yeah. it as um, as I mentioned earlier, our geographical area up here is huge, the service that we consider. So if we can, if we think about our neuromuscular consultant being like an umbrella, the top of that umbrella, within that umbrella, we have to, we liaise with all the local healthcare teams belonging to that youngster, in addition to the neuromuscular team within our specialist service. So it is with we have to forge good communication skills with our colleagues, not only in health, but also these families also need support from their local social care agencies or from their local voluntary organisations. And again, we need to forge that communication to give the best possible um, care that we can to youngsters and families who are on our caseload. So it is vitally important you have that communication across all agencies, not just with adults or paediatrics in health across all agencies and all services. 
<laughs> and all specialisms that are involved in the care of, of the youngster. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Anna. And Priya, in your, your opening remarks, you, you talked about how you say you're just a dietitian, but then um, you get lots of other things sort of come, come people raise with you. So, yeah, it'd be interesting. How, how do you sort of fit in with the rest of the team and how do you sort of share um, support needs of the people you're, you're working with? Um, so initially, uh, I receive a referrals, uh, most commonly through Dr. Adnan um, and other consultants within the trust, um, and I will do my assessment. But um, it's quite interesting, actually, because I would say I don't have that sort of network, say, as Sean does up in the north. Um, so I do feel like I'm just um, a dietitian, just in clinic. Um, doing my assessment and providing the advice to those patients and families. But having said that, um, I will, if I have come across something in my assessment, for example, a child sounds like their swallow is deteriorating or um, it sounds like they may need um, sort of adapted cutlery or things within the home, um, I think just knowing and touching on Sean's like the different healthcare professionals, just being able to approach or refer on to them. And I will just generally do a one off sort of assessment, give advice. Um, and then I do then, even though I will discharge them from my care here at GOSH, um, I will then ask the community dietitians to follow up. Um, because what I'm finding is that I do this one off assessment and I do personally worry like oh how much is that family gonna follow on from that advice that I've given and we've discussed even though a letter will be sent out as well but there's always that element of even so so being able to refer on to the community dietitians to follow up from a weight management point of view um and then just having that regular follow-up so it's quite limited I'd say from my point of view is just me myself and me myself referring on to a community dietitian and then if other professionals are required I would just refer on to them um so yeah I think it would be nice if maybe in the future we have more um opportunities to liaise with other professionals that are involved with with, with these patients brilliant thanks Priya um I'm going to bring in Romla with a question actually that is linked to something Sean also said but um, we had a question in advance around um, accessing peer support, and Sean, you mentioned your role in, in, in connecting sort of young people in particular. But Romney, you, you did mention it in your in your in your opening remarks. But could you explain a bit more about MDUK's peer support network and how people um, can can come to us to to be connected to somebody? And then Sean, it'd be interesting to hear how how that works in your, within your service as well, in particular. So yeah, Romney, if you wouldn't mind first. Yeah, so um, in terms of peer support, we have things on our website about some examples of the volunteers who have been trained um, that are available that we can put you in touch with. And um, there are more volunteers than what's on our website, so do bear that in mind. And there's also a get in touch form available on there. Perhaps the link could be shared in the chat or um, if anyone wants to get in touch with us afterwards, we can always point you to the right direction. Um, but most importantly, what we can do is link you with other parents of children, either with Duchenne or other muscle wasting conditions um, that are in a similar situation to you or have gone through the things that you are going through or perhaps struggling with. And we find that even if people have like a strong family or friend network around them, it can still be very beneficial to use the peer support network and um, speak to somebody who has this shared experience that perhaps you're going through or you're struggling with. Um, and just yeah, our volunteers have a better understanding of conditions and what to expect. So usually contact between yourselves and the volunteer will start off via email and then you can arrange phone calls um, as you wish with the volunteer that you're paired with. Um, anyone taking part in our peer support scheme does have to be over 18, which is why I'm recommending it for parents at the moment. But um, for anybody that is over 18 and has a muscle wasting condition or has Duchenne, um, they can also be paired with a person who has the same or similar condition and um, speak to that person themselves. Um, alternatively, there is, of course, the um, Facebook parent support group as well that is used. Um, and it's something that we can link you to because it's moderated by MDUK, but it just allows you to chat to more people or um, perhaps ask certain questions and hopefully get a reply to those issues that you're dealing with. And also um, another option would be 
our local muscle group. So we've just had our first face-to-face -face, um, regional muscle groups this summer, and I'm sure there'll be more coming up over the next year. Um, and this is also a great opportunity to sometimes meet parents or meet other people living with conditions. Um, and this will be face-to-face, -face, which some people do prefer. Um, so yeah, there'll be in things like that to deal with. Um, and yeah, if anybody would like to access peer support, do just get in touch with our helpline or info team. Um, and we'll be happy to point you in the right direction. Brilliant, thanks, Romla. And yeah, Sean, how does how does that work in terms of what you mentioned connecting young people within your area? Um, how does yeah. how does that work? Indeed, um, I mean, we uh, we always recognise um, MD UK and the support that they give and give nationally to to parents and families and carers. Sometimes their carers want something more local to them, um, and what we try and do then here. We, we do have a variety of initiatives. Um, for instance, that a recent issues, initiative we, we've got going is that uh, we have um, we have about I think it's about twenty odd teenage uh, lads with DMD um, at the moment, and um, we recognise that that particular period can be very isolating uh, for that youngster, particularly it might be as their um, mobility is deteriorating or perhaps just their general. Um, awareness of other youngsters of their age that they're different from others and we do find that that um sometimes it's a question of buddying up if we if we can ma if we can individually match a youngster and family with another youngster and family on our books and they both wish to to participate then then that is 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 a job a job well done um and then that individual family can offer the other individual family support they do activities together etc um, and share things which is what it's all about um we all, we always think of the youngster but so often as well it's siblings and um parents and carers who are sometimes forgotten in amongst all this so again here in Sheffield we'll we try and just think a little bit more laterally about what might we what might we we could offer that is supportive to parents locally in our area so we're always we're always trying to think up new ways different ways and just thinking a little bit more outside the box and can I just ask, um, Sean, so thinking about um, families, siblings who may need support, mm. um, especially as the condition um, progresses and beca can become really challenging, um, would sort of psychology support be available or would a referral be needed for that? We're extremely lucky in Sheffield as we've just appointed our first neuromuscular uh, psychologist. Um, what we also have up here is what well, obviously we have cams, etc. But also what we have up here is um, we use a um, an organisation that has that is out and about there nationally um, for the so what I call the first line of um, accessing support, um, and um, that has been taken up. Um, quite a, uh, on a number of occasions by our youngsters, particularly those of teenage years, because that's really the, 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 uh, the age range that um, they find particularly very difficult to deal with their condition, to deal with being different from their peers, and why has it happened to me? So we have a range of, of, um, of support up here that we use fully, um, and there isn't enough psychology support. <laughs> Well, I, could, I, could, I could talk about that till the cows come home, but there isn't enough funded psychology support in the NHS per se. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Sean, I couldn't agree more on that on that point. I think we could have a whole seminar on, on why that's such a big issue and particularly the impact that, uh, well, it's, it's been a historic issue for our community and coming through COVID has had an even bigger effect on that. And uh, yeah, I, it, 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 I, I can only agree. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Um, one of the uh, another question that came through in advance was around um, sort of managing fatigue um, for for young people with with DMD. We've we've actually produced a fatigue resource um, this year, but I'd be interested to hear, um, Sean, how how common that is and how how you advise people to kind of manage fatigue and also whether Priya, that that comes through in a dietitian role or whether that's a, an, an inevitable impact of living of living with a condition like Duchenne and actually there's not much diet can do. I'd be very interested in, 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 in both your views. Maybe Sean come to you first. Yeah, um, so fatigue is is very important and, and is very much it's very much up there as as, as one of the, the main things that, that 
that we, we see and we deal with. Um, my physiotherapist colleagues, neuromuscular physiotherapist colleagues, when we uh, review a youngster in clinic, because they come to us every uh, six months, that is always, always very much part of the assessment, as indeed the consultants um, always ask about that. Um, and then, and that is all to do with, particularly if you think about the earlier, earlier age is pacing um, and looking at ways of managing that fatigue throughout the day. That could also mean um, contacting the school as well. Um, and again, discussing the other ish, the other difficulties surrounding DMD and talking about fatigue and how that particular youngster can be best supported in this, during the school day to manage their fatigue. So there's a number of ways we, we actually um, deal with that. Yeah, and thank you, thank you. And Priya, so Priya, is there a role in, in, from your side in terms of do you have is there sort of especially dietitian advice that around fatigue as well? Um, yeah, so just thinking about keeping up energy levels and going back to nutritional blood. So if they have been tested, looking at levels, not just um, ones I mentioned earlier, like calcium, bone profile, vitamin D, but iron levels are also important. Um, and just having that sort of balanced diet. So looking at iron levels, ferritin levels, and if they're low, um, liaising with GPs, consultants to start supplementation. And then from a diet perspective, um, if there are dietary requirements such as like being vegetarian or um having doing, doing a diet history or sort of um highlight whether there are limited um you know dietary sources of iron calcium vitamin d and that's where my role is to give advice on what foods they can start to include to ensure that we improve those in, in the diet as well um, and that just helps overall um i think diet and supplementation come hand in hand in providing um energy levels um and also the vitamin d because having a really low vitamin d level um can cause fatigue as well so um just making sure keeping on top of that as well as diet is important brilliant thank you very much um now unless we get any more questions through the q a i think this will be our last question and it's, and it's very specific actually so i'll come to you first romla although sean you may have dealt with a question like this in the in the in the past as well the question is someone who's um interested in um learn, learning to drive with the with duchen and kind of how they can go about finding how, how to do that so yeah romla is that something we've we've, we've provided advice on yeah, so in terms of the advice I'd give is that the first step would always be to apply for your provisional license if you haven't already. And while doing so, you would declare that you've got a medical condition, provide some information about how this would affect you. And then the DVLA will get in touch usually with your neuromuscular consultant or their team to get some further information, kind of check that you are fit to drive. And then they would like most likely send you over to a um, an assessment centre that can um, check things like your eyesight and your ability to use a, a gear stick or a wheelchair, not wheelchair, a um, other wheel of a car, of course, um, and check what adaptations you may need to make sure that you are able to um, drive. And a great place that does this is um, driving mobility. So they have quite a lot of assessment centers across the country and they help you with assisted driving, accessibility, and just making this as independent as possible. And they do work with the Department for Transport. So they are, um, quite a big organization. Um, what's also great about the driving mobility is that they can also do passenger assessments. So say if you know if, if the parent or carer is one that's driving, but you have issues with getting the child into the car, or, um, or if you know if the child's growing and you're no, no longer able to lift them in if you're the parent or the carer, they can also help you with things like that, like hoists or swivel seats. Um, but back to learning to drive, some individuals, especially if they're wheelchair users would prefer or they'd need to learn in their own adapted vehicle or wheelchair accessible vehicle. And so they may choose to get a motivity vehicle um, if they're eligible for it ahead of learning to drive as a preparation um, sort of thing. And there is also a charitable grant scheme that covers driving lessons for disabled people organized by motivity. Um, for those that either have a mobility car already or who have placed an order. So this could be very useful if perhaps you're struggling with you know, um, affording to do these lessons as it can be quite a big expense, as I know. Um, and also some of the larger nationwide driving lesson providers, such as um, BSM, they do have information about learning to drive with a disability on their website. And it would just be really important to speak to whoever you're um, hoping to be your driving instructor, make it very clear that this is what you need, this is your condition, and see if they're comfortable to 
teach you how to drive or if they need to advise you to ask somebody else um, and hopefully they'll be really transparent about this but yeah if there's anything further or any more specific questions i'd be happy to deal with that after the session so do just get in touch with us directly if you need any more advice on this brilliant thanks Rob. No, that was very comprehensive sean i don't know if you've got anything to add of advice you've given but that was that seemed to be pretty 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 full on no indeed i, I handed that firmly over to Rama. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant well done um, well, we, that's the end of our of our questions. So, um, a huge thank you to our our panel, both uh, uh, Adnan and Linda, first of all, but then Sean, Romla, and, and Priya. Um, Sean, Romla, and Priya, I don't know if you've got any sort of final things you want to add um, to, to add, or whether or whether we sort of close now. I think we've we've covered a great, great range of topics. So, thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you. So, yeah. So, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, a reminder, a huge thanks again to our sponsors, um, PTC Therapeutics and Sarepta um, Therapeutics. Um, thanks for the questions we had in advance and for the conversation. Um, a reminder that you can see all the recordings um, of the sessions um, over the past two and a half years now um, on our website. Uh, and this one will be posted there um, later this week. Um, he says checking that it's only Wednesday, I think. Um, and we'll be in touch with some sort of feedback survey shortly. Um, but thank you very much um, for joining us. Uh, details of our helpline are on the screen now so do get in touch if you uh, would like um, to speak to Romla or one of her colleagues um, about anything that came up today or any other aspect um, of, of living with a muscle wasted condition um, so thank you very much enjoy the rest of your day and take care thanks all bye bye <laughs>